<laughs> That's why we put a lid on it. Okay. How many new people are here? Oh, I forgot. That. Yeah. Okay. And I know there's. I know when I introduce Mark, you're going to have to fill us in with who's here to see you. He, uh, his daughter's here from Mechanicsburg and some other friends of his. But anyhow, I'd like to introduce uh, Mark Vogel, and I'll give you a little bit of a background on him. He is a, a distinguished military graduate of the Citadel. He earned his Bachelor of Science in Education with a concentration in history. He was commissioned a second lieutenant of infantry in the regular army of the United States upon his graduation day. Mark served for nine years. Assignments included commander of a mechanized infantry company in the third armor division as the commandant of the headquarters uh, ready first brigade third armor division his last assignment was as an assistant professor of military science at fordham university and during that assignment he was detailed to prepare a tactical walking tour of the battle of gettysburg for all rotc cadets on the east coast he is an author of six books. He has 20 different programs that he has. And he has given his program in 13 of the Confederate States of America already. <laughs> but five other states in the Union. Uh, he is a hometown boy because he graduated in 1973 from Milton Hershey. So I would like for us, the Hershey Civil War Roundtable, to give Mark a nice warm welcome. Okay, um, I normally don't use the microphone, so if you're having problems hearing me, you can tell me now and we'll go ahead and do that. If you get me all right, then we won't use it. Anybody here say I need one? Okay. Um, I really want to first thank you all for letting me come here for the invitation. I got it about a year ago from Tom. And for me, I have spoken for over about 15 years now and all over many, many places. There's just a few places that I hold close to my heart. One of them was a camp in Kannapolis, North Carolina, where my great-great-grandfather of the 33rd North Carolina was a member of the Confederate Veterans. I spoke to that camp. And it had a real touch for me. And there's some other places, but I got to tell you, one was Gettysburg. But this one has a lot of touch for me. Um, for the people who know Milton Hershey School, that one, that one changed his life. And I don't mean to give up on you guys. But for a lot of us, that's home. Excuse me. Excuse me. Sorry about that, but when it gets you from the gut, there's nothing you can do about it except live for it. Um, I can only tell you, like Fred Keeper here is a Hershey man, and he reached out when I was attending, wanted to attend the Citadel. They appointed him as a Hershey Citadel man to, to get me ready to go. And in my class, we had 44 guys in my company, Alpha Company as freshmen. We graduated 13. So Fred did something there. Okay. He had an impact on me as Milton Hershey had an impact on me. And I'm really, really, I'm sorry that I got a little emotional there, but it really hits home. I have three brothers and a sister. And if I, if I spent from now to the end of the week telling you what that school did for us, it would take that long and long. So thank you very much for Hershey. And let me tell you, this place, when I walked in here this morning, it was like, when we went to Milton Hershey School, it was like stepping into a new class. It was like stepping into the, almost heaven as far as what life could be like. And when I walked in here, this place matched it. And, and so Hershey, if you're from here or from the general area, you all have an unbelievable um, reputation and an unbelievable image across the nation. 
Um, so again, I really want to say thank you to you for that. Tonight we're going to talk about something. Um, like I, when I was talking with Tommy, I, I, we have about 20 programs prepared. And when you all pick this one, which is called The View from Seminary Ridge, it really kind of uh, tossed me a little bit because you all are right here near Gettysburg and you've probably studied the battle a lot. And so I was kind of surprised you would ask for another speaker in that area. Hopefully tonight I'll be talking about things that you haven't heard before. I hope I'm not repeating somebody else. But I'll tell you how this, um, how this came about. When, when I was eight years old, my dad died. And I was the oldest of five. And my mom went to work, and it was up to me to take care of the kids. And I needed a male role model. My male role model that I adopted was Robert E. Lee. And I started studying him on, at eight years old, and I've studied him to this day. And so there's a real personal connection with that gentleman. And my great-great-grandfather fought in the 30, with the 33rd North Carolina and lost his leg at Chancellorsville as a part of Jackson's attack. So there is family connections all over this. And I tell you that not for any other reason than I'm going to tell you some things tonight that you might shake your head and say, well, you know, that's that guy's opinion, but I don't agree with him. Well, that's okay. I, I'm not here to try to convince you. I'm only telling you the personal side of it because for me what happened was as a kid you learn about Robert E. Lee and you learn about his victories and then we get to Gettysburg and it ends up with Pickett's Charge. And as an infantry officer, which is what I am, I over and over again I would scratch my head and look at the different battles all the way from 62 to 65 and go, well what happened at Gettysburg? And fortunately, God has his way of doing things. And so he had me assigned to Fordham University and then had me assigned for the Army to study the battle and write the walking tour. So I was professionally paid to study and analyze that battle. And what I'm bringing to you is the results of that study, but different from what the Army told me to do. The Army told me to create a, wa a tactical walking tour for cadets that they could take that tour of Gettysburg and learn from it modern lessons. That's not what tonight's about. Tonight is not about a tactical walking tour. Tonight is about why did Robert E. Lee do Pickett's Charge? In my view, there are five or you could say six areas that influenced Robert E. Lee on the, on the afternoon and evening of the 2nd of July in his thoughts and in his decision making on what he was going to do. And those five or six areas is what we're going to talk about tonight. And the first one of those areas is family heritage. Robert E. Lee is unique among the Confederate generals and among the Yankee generals um, in that his family, not, there were others, but he had a direct family relationship to the creation of the United States of America. The Lees in Virginia, not only did his father command the cavalry of George Washington, but the Lee, two Lees of Virginia signed the Declaration of Independence. One Lee was the president of the Congress during the Revolution. And then what happens is people start seeing that the Articles of Confederation aren't going to work. And so they decide to call together a convention. Now when they called that convention, it was not called to create the new constitution. It was called to see if they could correct the Articles of Confederation. Now from a history major's point of view and from a person who has been in politics point of view, this is a teaching moment for y'all. Because there are people who are talking about doing a convention of states 
in order to fix the Constitution. The last time we did that, we erased the Constitution and created a brand new one. So I warn you, or at least want you to think about what happened the first time with the Articles of Confederation. So anyway, and, and Richard Henry Lee was asked to be a delegate from Virginia for the Constitutional Convention. He rejected that. He did not attend that convention. Not only that, but he and Patrick Henry opposed the Constitution of the United States. Now, why am I bringing this up while we're talking about Pickett's charge? Because, as I said, I am a descendant of a man who fought in the war, and probably a few of y'all, or maybe all of them. But not all of my, my grandfather had absolutely nothing, my great-great-grandfather's family had absolutely nothing to do with creating the United States of America, other than his kin may have served in the war as a private for a few months. But in the Lee case, they had a lot to do with the creation of this country. When George Washington died, the man Congress asked to speak for George Washington was Robert E. Lee's dad. And, and his dad is the one that said, my eyes aren't as good as they used to be. His dad said, First in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. Second to none in the humble and endearing scenes of private life. Now again, I bring this up because obviously there's a tie there. I remember as a young child when I was about seven years old before my dad died, he would bring people to the house. He would bring, men would come to the house and they would sit in the dining room, at the dining room table, and play chess. And as a little seven-year-old, I would look at those men and think, they must be really important because my dad brought them here. They must be really good people. Well, in the case of Robert E. Lee, those really good people are George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Mason. And so you're talking about when he has to decide in 1861, which way he's going. Remember where he's coming from. He did. There's a, his wife talks about that night at Arlington when he had to make his decision. She was in and couldn't go to the second floor where his bedroom was. So she was downstairs on the first floor and heard him all night long walking back and forth. And she says in her own hand, she heard him hit his knees at least twice. So, and that morning, when he comes down and, is, and the decision is made, she says he is relieved that he is happy with his decision, which is that he goes with Virginia. But now remember, we're talking about five or six, and so I may come back to this a little later, but I just want to try to make sure it's implanted in your head the feelings that must have gone through him as he decided to be a part of the breaking of the Union. Okay. The second area that I think is pretty important when you consider when Robert E. Lee and we're talking about why he will do Pickett's charge is his military career prior to 1861. Robert E. Lee is an amazing man and when he was young and he earned his nomination to West Point for a long time, for most of my life, I regurgitated what I had heard, which is that Robert E. Lee spent four years at West Point and was the only man in four years to go through West Point without receiving a demerit. 
in preparation for you and more research, I found out that's incorrect. There were at least five men in his class that did not receive a demerit. I have to tell you folks, as a Citadel graduate, and, and I think Fred would be with me on this, I don't understand how he went a week uh, <laughs> to do what he did mm -hmm. is a remarkable feat. Because you gotta understand, it starts at, at Reveille and it ends at Taps. Everything you do in a day is monitored. Any mistake is a demerit. Any mistake. So to do four years without a demerit at West Point is an accomplishment that no one today can do. It's, it's literally impossible. I don't know how he did. But that's just the beginning of it. Um, he ends up going from West Point, and, and pretty early in his career, he's going to end up in the Mexican War. And he'll work directly for Winfield Scott. And when he does that, he actually earns two battlefield commissions. In other words, they promoted him twice on the battlefield for his actions. There was only one other man in the Mexican War who earned more promotions, Stonewall Jackson. So, from the, and, and they pointed out in him the, the qualities that he would that he would become known for. He had an extremely good eye for the ground. That's a big deal. That's when you're when you're maybe people in here who have served in the service, and particularly in infantry or combat formations on the ground, because this really doesn't have anything to do with the Navy or or the Air Force, but. For us, for the infantrymen, knowing the ground and how to use it is critical. And in Mexico, that's where Lee will earn his name. That's where he'll become important and where Winfield Scott will learn that he is the best in the Army, that he's the guy. And that's going to come back around when we get to the point where they're going to have to pick a commander for the Federal Army. So he does that. Then he does, then he'll go to um, New York and he'll be, he'll take care of the harbor there for a while. Then he'll go to West Point and be the commandant there. And then he comes out to Texas and he'll be uh, number two there. And he'll actually meet um, General uh, Trimble. No, that's not the right guy. That's not the right man. There's a, a, a fellow in Texas and the name is, is, I'm losing it right at this minute. But there was a fellow in Texas that, He's a brigadier general, and he's the guy in charge of all the troops in Texas and the armory. And him and Lee meet in San Antonio the day before that general will surrender Texas to the Confederates. And Lee, now down there, that was a time, imagine, look at now, look at what we have now in some of the violence that you have. Imagine going into San Antonio at the time of secession. And there are federal forces there, and then there are Texas militia forces there. And they're there for the same reason. It's who's going to come out on top of this. But they weren't at the point, nobody's done anything yet. Sumter hadn't happened yet, none of that. Okay, But you still have the excitement and the building of an anxiety between these two groups. And so when Lee gets to San Antonio, he actually puts his civilian clothes on to walk down the street to go meet this general. And from my point of view, and if you're not a Christian or a man of faith, we're going to kind of bump into you right here. But from my point of view, this is where Providence, you can see Providence in San Antonio like this. Because how difficult would it have been for one of the Texans to have drank too much and started a fight with a federal soldier? How hard would that have been? And if it did happen, and shots were fired, Robert E. Lee was a federal officer. He was still in the United States Army. So whose side would he have been on if a shot had been fired? It's something to think about. It doesn't have directly to do with Pickett's charge, but it's important because it, it lays the first piece of evidence of providence, that nothing did happen. 
that, that as, as bad as that situation could have been, and not on purpose, not that some Texas colonel would have told his men attack the Federals, but just the accident of it. I mean, these weren't trained, the Texans weren't trained soldiers, they were just guys that got together and made a militia unit and went to San Antonio. That's it, that's all the training they had. You know, so you're talking about in undisciplined forces in a chaotic situation, and nothing had happened. Anyway, so, and then Lee gets to, he's still in the Army, and he travels all the way to uh, Washington, and he goes and he's offered command of all the federal forces. Now think about that one. Each of you in this room has a profession, and each of you in this room has probably tried to be really good at it. And maybe there's some honors in your profession, or maybe there are some degrees of professionalism, or maybe it's just a matter of how much money you make. But the point is that you measure yourself against your profession and how other people see you. Now, in Lee's case, we're talking about being offered command of an army of, at minimum, 75,000. And that's just the opening bid. So he's offered the top job that he's worked his entire life to be recognized for. That's number two. Okay, the next area that I would cover is Robert E. Lee's audacity and his complete dependence on the idea of the offensive. Today, the United States military teaches the nine principles of war, and they still teach them, and it was taught at the time of Robert E. Lee. And one of those principles is the offensive. And the offensive is about controlling your opponent. It's about controlling what's going on. And audacity is about the ability to do things that other people wouldn't do in the offensive. And in Lee's case, that's what he learned over his military career. Now on this, you gotta remember, who was the greatest military commander just prior to this time, Napoleon. And his reliance, his constant reliance, is on the offense, the spirit of the offense. And so this is a, this is a huge part of where Pickett's charge comes from. What it, really, what it really amounts to is, and they teach us this, I don't know what they're teaching today because I'm not in there, but they taught us that, that you want to be on the offense. Now, the interesting part of that today, if you served in the United States Army, is what are the odds supposed to be? If I'm going to attack somebody, what is the numbers supposed to be? The numbers are supposed to be three to one. So if you have one, I have three. If you have 100, I have 300. If you have 5,000, I have 15,000. Here's where the audacity comes in. Because in Robert E. Lee's case, he will never get near three to one in the advantage. He will always be at one to one or less, always. So it's the audacity, the ability to think offensively when you don't have the resources to do it that is super key with Robert E. Lee. And this audacity, I mean, when you, when you look at Chancellorsville, the Battle of Chancellorsville, and um, has your, just so I get an idea, Tommy, did you guys have had an, anything on Chancellorsville any time recently? Yes. Okay. So you're familiar with Chancellorsville, and you're familiar with the fact that he was outnumbered two and a half or three to one. And he still goes on the offensive. 
He, he, Hooker, General Hooker, deserves a lot of credit for what he was able to do up to the point where he makes contact with the Confederates in the woods around Chancellorsville. He's the only general I'm aware of that prior to, I mean, at, up to this point in the war, where he actually gets a foot, uh, he actually gets ahead of Robert E. Lee, and actually ends up somewhere Lee doesn't anticipate. And, but Hooker thinks that if I outnumber him, and if I can get behind him, he's going to do what the textbooks tell you to do, which is leave, get out of the way. And Lee does the exact opposite. Not only does he stand there to fight him, but he turns around to attack him. And that's what, in, in the case, in Hooker's case, that's what in the end is going to change that balance. Because he, Lee does the total <coughs> unexpected on that. And you have Stonewall Jackson involved in this. And that's a pair, that's a combination that's unbeatable. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was in... Um, Sam Davis Youth Camp, which some of you, if you're of any Southern um, background at all, there the Sons of Confederate Veterans every year holds two Sam Davis Youth Camps. Those are in South Carolina and Texas, and the idea is to bring kids together to teach them Southern culture, Southern history, to actually learn how to dance, do the old dances. Um, they learn how to fire a musket. Uh, the one in Texas learns how to fire, they learn how to fire a cannon with live rounds. I mean, th this is a real, this is a week-long camp. And I was down there and I was talking to them, I'm their first speaker, and I was talking to them about leadership and the ability to find, if you're the leader, the ability to find a person who sees things and thinks of things like you do. Almost like your mirrors, but not exactly. Because in the case of the Lee-Jackson connection, it's Lee who has the strategic audacity, but it's Jackson who has the tactical audacity. At the Battle of Kernstown in the Shenandoah, Jackson actually attacks the Yankees with a right and a left, and nobody in the middle. Nobody. But the Yankees don't expect that. Who will do that? Who will split his force? and attack with the right and the left and have nothing in the middle. But Jackson had to do it because he was outnumbered three to one. So he took a bet. These are woods, they won't check them out, and he got into a fight. Now it turns out he's going to end up losing the Battle of Kernstown, which is the only battle in the Shenandoah he lost, but he didn't lose it because his middle was open. He lost it because one side ran, one of his flanks ran out of ammunition and backed up. And, that's, and then they had to break and run. So anyway, my point is that audacity is a key thing, and it's a driver at Gettysburg. Now, you run into Longstreet, and he's not a believer in audacity. And he's not a believer in the offense either. Now, when you're, you got, there, there's a part in history with the Confederate Army that if you haven't really, you got to pay attention to the details, and maybe you're just not there yet, or you forgot it, or you haven't done it yet. But Longstreet's last experience with Robert E. Lee before Gettysburg is at Fredericksburg, not at Chancellorsville. Longstreet is not at Chancellorsville. He's at Fredericksburg. And in that battle, it's the classic Stonewall defense with with his core behind a stone wall on a sunken road, and Jackson on his right behind railroads, and the Yankees just keep coming at him. And it's just a duck shoot is all it is. They don't literally have to do anything, especially Longstreet's core, never even has to move. He just sits there and shoots them down. So he is aware of the power of the defense if, you have an opponent that will just charge into him. And that's what he constantly argues for in the Gettysburg campaign, is he's constantly arguing what we need to do is find a place, a good defensive position, set up in a good defensive position, and wait. The problem with that is 
that if the Yankees don't attack, then you're just burning time. You're just sitting there. And in Lee's, in Lee's mind and in other people's minds, it's the offense that changes things, not the defense. Now, in Longstreet's case, maybe, maybe you're already aware of this, but even before Gettysburg happened, Longstreet goes to President Davis in May and tells President Davis that the summer campaign should be about moving some of the Army of Northern Virginia west to join with Johnston and Pemberton to fight Grant. Longstreet makes that suggestion. And there are two meetings, high-level strategy meetings <coughs> in late May between Davis and Lee. The second meeting is Davis, Lee, and the entire Confederate cabinet. That's on May 26th. And what they discuss is Lee's plan and Longstreet's plan, although Davis never mentions Longstreet. But he does propose that instead of invasion into Pennsylvania, what we do is take a portion of the Army of <coughs> Virginia and send it west to relieve Vicksburg. That, that's where you get some differences there. And, and we'll go into a little more as we get through this here. Okay. Now here's one if you're an atheist or if you're a person who doesn't believe faith or God has any place in history, then I have to ask you to hold your ears closed and ignore them for the next period. Because I feel, after studying generally for as long as I have, that his faith in God and his faith in the Bible and Christian religion has everything to do with what goes on at Mount's Church. If you're a Catholic, you know that there are two books in our Bible, 1st and 2nd Maccabees, that are not in the, the Protestant Bible, although this is the point that maybe some of you, maybe somebody in this room can straighten out for me. Episcop Episcopalians, I've always wondered if they use the Catholic Bible. Because if they do, or Anglicans, either one, they're both the same. If they do, it explains why Robert E. Lee would say to his generals, the numbers don't matter. In other words, it doesn't matter that we're outnumbered. It doesn't matter that we don't have three to one. That is exactly what is taught in Maccabees. That if you have God, the numbers don't matter. Now, in Lee's case, his faith is, is probably one of the undertold stories of Robert Ewell. His faith was at least what that of George Washington, at least that of the founders of this nation, and maybe more. Now, let me give you a little background here. Um, for the past five years, my focus in history has been on the 300 years used to create this country between Christopher Columbus and uh, the, um, inaugura Washington's inauguration. And I've been on five for five years. That is what I've read, studied, thought about, considered. And I'm telling you standing here that this nation was not only a Christian nation because of the founders, it was a Christian nation because of every, almost every man that lived and woman that lived in America between Columbus and George Washington. Now, I, it would take me a lot longer to give you the evidence, but believe me, I have 40 books at home, and that's not that's the actual number. 40 books at home to study this, to know that what I'm saying is that, 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 that their faith was unquestioned. One example, did you know that in the middle of the inauguration of George Washington, in the middle of it, they stopped the service. Every elected, federally elected official of this nation went to church because Congress passed a resolution that said, thank God for the revolution and the Constitution. They went to church, 
heard a sermon, came back, and finished the inauguration. I bring it up because we're not, unfortunately, folks, we're not aware of our own history. And what we are being told is skewed so far. I don't know if there's any Southern sympathizers in here. I've been a Southern sympathizer because of my Nana when I was seven years old when she taught me about my great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather. And so I know that American history can be shaped, rewritten, nudged to make certain things look one way that really weren't that way. Now, I'm not defending slavery and all that other. I'm not doing that. But what I'm telling you is that the history of, the, of this fight that we're talking about, the Civil War, wasn't only about slavery. I won't say it wasn't about slavery. I said it wasn't only about slavery. And the, the religious aspect of it is massive in what was going on. It's huge. And it, so anyway, Robert E. Lee has this very strong faith. He goes to God when he has to make a decision. Do I take the commission from Lincoln or do I go with Virginia? He constantly goes to God. And if you read his reports, and one thing I, I'm sure many of you already do, if you start studying history pretty soon, you put down the guys who are writing today and you pick up the guys who were writing back then. If you read Lee's letters, the word providence is all over them. And providence is God's will. If Lee wins a victory, he didn't win it. God won it. But if he loses, he says, I lost it. And all of that, and it's a constant thing. I mean, in Lee's case, and, and there's a book called Christ in the Camp. If you don't have it, you should get it. And it is written by the chaplain of Longstreet's Corps. It was Lee that encouraged him to write it. And the, and the, the book is about 400 pages long. And basically, it lays out the religious history of the Southern armies during the war. And, it, and there's story after story and letter after letter of people that talk about Lee and his faith. And how he could be in the middle of a battle, in the middle of a battle, right in the front line. And if he came up on Confederate soldiers in a group praying, he would stop and dismount and join the group in the middle of a battle. So it's his faith that's super important because the reason I'm bringing this up is when, when we get to the point where we start talking about Pickett's Charge and we get to the questions that you're going to ask me at the end of this and you're going to tell me about a mile in width and you're going to tell me about no cover and you're going to tell me about how many rifles and how many cannons and who's more effective and the whole question is going to be how could you ever do that? Okay, I will reassert a faith in God. So that's why I'm, I'm being so strong on it right now, because that faith makes all the difference. And for the guys that served in the service, I would venture to say that some of those guys felt like I did when I served in the service, which is, I'm in God's hands at this point. It's not up to me anymore. So faith is a, is a huge part of what's going on. Like I said, in Maccabees, it talks about the numbers not matter. Okay, five and six. Lee's strategic and tactical, the situation here in Gettysburg. Okay. Lee was not the perfect commander. So shiny he, he, he had learned his profession as he learned it. And so he had certain precepts about how you win battles and how you win wars. And he didn't have the wider view that maybe is around today for some people. And so he constantly looks at the only way really to win this war is for a decisive knockout blow against the Union Army. And that's what he's pitching when he talks to Davis in May. And you know, they actually voted. That Lee. At, the, at that cabinet meeting I told you about on May 26th, it, Davis, Davis offered 
the idea of let's move some of the Army in Northern Virginia to the West and relieve Pemberton. And they took a vote. Two people voted for Davis's plan. Davis and Secretary Reagan, postmaster from Texas. Every other cabinet official voted with Robert E. Lee. Now, once that was kind of established that the majority of the people agreed with an offensive in Pennsylvania, then it was a question of what are we going to try to accomplish? In Davis's case, he hoped that they would accomplish staying in Pennsylvania, doing damage to the Army, and as a result, if you could put pressure, enough pressure on me, that would force Grant and to take some forces away from Vicksburg and draw them east to Pennsylvania. That was what Davis hoped that would be accomplished by the Gettysburg campaign. But that wasn't what Lee hoped would be accomplished. What he wanted was a knockdown, drag out fight, a decisive victory that would either annihilate the Army of the Potomac or put it in such a bad shape that he could blow through it towards either Baltimore or Washington. That's what Lee wanted. And it's that constant, and, and you know, when you look at him from the very beginning, Robert E. Lee is fixated from the very beginning, from 62 on, in trying to put the Yankees into, into positions where their army will be obliterated. He's not just trying to slow him down. He's not just trying to beat him but retain his force. He is trying to annihilate them. And he's willing to lose men to do it. He's willing to commit the force to exterminate the Yankees. And if we lose every man but one, and they lose every man, then we won. And that's a big difference. There's a huge difference mentally. And it's why he's so successful in the fights he's in. When, he, when you look at the first fight, where it's uh, at Fair Oaks or Seven Pines, right there outside of Richmond, and he brings Jackson in. Look how Jackson, look where Jackson's put on that field, where he's supposed to be. He's supposed to be off the right flank of the Yankees and to roll them up, to come in kind of behind him and on their right flank and just roll them up. The whole idea is to obliterate that army right there. The problem is Jackson doesn't get there. So instead, A.P. Hill and those guys start the attack with Jackson not even on the field. So, but, but over and over again, through the, the, the battles and the scenarios that Lee runs up into Gettysburg, every time the objective is to break an army. So that's important. Now, on the, so we talked about the strategic situation. We talked about Davis wants this. And, now, let me add one thing here, and I don't know if you've ever thought about it, so I'll just throw it out there. And this is, I haven't, folks, I don't read modern guys. If somebody sits here and says, did you read this guy's book or that guy? I probably haven't read it. What I read are the guys that wrote before PC, and I read the actual people. So, like, uh, Alexander, the, the artillery commander for the Confederate Army. I've read his memoirs. I've read everything that Robert E. Lee Jr. wrote. I've read everything uh, on Longstreet and Hood, who wrote a book, which is really pretty good. Some of it's really bad, but some of it's like Trump, but some of it's really, and I love Trump, but he has a point where the, he talks too bluntly, and Hood does that in his book. But anyway, um, so I, I, I study battles, I, re I read what I can read, but I want to read, my, I want my thoughts to be mine. I don't want them to be anybody else's. So the strategy I'm going to talk to you about is maybe you heard of it, maybe you haven't. What I think a possible alternative, alternative strategy could have been is a variant of Jefferson Davis. Now, I don't think they ever could have put enough pressure on me unless they actually did what Lee does, which is pick his truck. I don't think they could have done enough pressure on me or Pennsylvania or any of the cities 
to get them to pull troops off of Vicksburg. I don't see it. I just don't. There's no way to easy do it, first of all. And then second, I just don't see it. But I do think the alternative for Lee could have been to go into Pennsylvania and spread out like he did spread out, occupy as much of Pennsylvania as you can, and stay as long as you can. But, and here's the big difference, retain your force, preserve your force, with the goal being to have the Army of Northern Virginia at 80,000 in the summer of 1864. Because remember what's coming in 64, the Lincoln election. And that's where we might have been able to win the election. If we would have been able to win the political campaign in 64, we would have won the war. So the idea is, and what did George Washington do during the revolution? His idea was keep my army in the field. Not win every battle, not always beat the British, keep my army in the field. And it's just like what the Vietnamese did to us. If you keep killing them and they keep standing up and shooting back, and you keep killing them and they keep standing up, sooner or later you're going to get tired of that. And, and so the alternative strategy could have been not to fight a decisive battle, but not to think that you're going to pull troops away from victory. You're not going to do that. What you got to do is keep armies in the field. Anyway, that's an alternative. Okay. But at the point where we're in Gettysburg, in July of 62, uh, 63, 2nd of July, that option is out. We're in committed now in an all-out fight like Lee wanted. And now the question is, how do I get my knockout blow? Now, there's Longstreet and, and others um, talk about either a flanking movement, probably around the Lee's right, or the Yankee left, towards Little Round Top, or breaking contact and trying to move around that flank. I would argue both of those are not reasonable. First of all, um, Little Round Top, by, by the end of the second, is easily manned by the Union forces with cannon on top of the hill and forces behind Little Round Top and cavalry behind those. So you're not going to go around that far. And on the other hand, if you try to break contact and move around the army, which is what everybody suggests, you need to read Napoleon's Maxim Third. Napoleon says very clearly, do not flank march in front of an enemy deployed. That's what you would have had to do. You would have had to break contact, back up, and then march sideways with the whole Yankee army on the line in front of you. And it, it, you wouldn't, and then not only that, supposing you were able to pull it off, supposing you were able to break contact, which I don't think they could have done, but if you did it, and if Meade went to sleep, which I doubt, okay, and you start marching, where are you going? I mean, when you go south of Gettysburg and then east, where are you going? Okay, and what, what's the land like to fight on? And remember now, how much artillery, how much, how much artillery ammunition did Lee have on the second, at the end of the second? He had one good attack with me. That's it. That's all he had. So that's, that's the big thing that keeps people keep forgetting is the logistics of an offense in Lee's case and the fact that there really wasn't a supply train. So you're not going to, whatever you got is what you got and that's all you're going to have. So that those two ideas just don't make sense and they don't make sense to Robert E. Lee. So we come to the frontal attack and the logic placed there is that he attacked on both flanks and he felt that there might be a weakness there in the center. The other part of it is that he attempts to use his artillery in a way, it's almost super Napoleon. It's not Napoleon, it's more than Napoleon. Napoleon's use of artillery, the reason he's, he's cited for that over and over again is because Napoleon decides to use artillery like tanks. 
and he decides that the artillery is going to go in front of the infantry column that attacks. And so you're just going to keep pushing this artillery in front of the infantry, and you're going to focus it on, now remember when they fought, they fought in squares mostly, and so you're trying to fire on the corners of that square and break a hole that the column can go through. And that's what Napoleon thought about when you, when you read him and you study what he did with his artillery. But when you look at Lee, what he's doing is using 180 guns in a semicircle to saturate an area, to pre-saturate it before you launch the offensive. <coughs> and in my view, that that's fairly new. That's not something you see a lot in any place before here, and not to the point that he did. And that land laid like that. You could do it. Better. You could actually get. 180 guns pointed at a target. Now the bad news was that our, meaning the Southern, our technology when it came to artillery just wasn't up to the Yankees. We could not do what they did. Our fuses were not accurate in time where the Yankees were. And so they could fire rounds and once they measured it and they knew the measurements for the fuses, they could fire airbush over a target and more or less hit it. We could, and so that that bombardment that goes on on Cemetery Hill and Cemetery Ridge is in effect. It just doesn't clean it out like they thought. So, um, so that's the the situation is that there is only the this, straightforward attack. Now, I'm almost there, guys. Um, last last point I'll bring up before you open up on me with the shrubshooters. <laughs> um, people will tell me that that, that, that that was ridiculous and ludicrous in no way. Well, first of all, I've walked that ground. It is not flat. We all know that. Anybody who's been on that ground knows that. You know what it reminds me of is the ocean. You have these, the ground goes like this, just like waves. And you go down into these holes and back up. So there's nobody shooting at you over, first of all, rifles didn't even have a range for a while. But second, you're dropping up and down. And so their effective range at 400 yards is about what you're talking about. And then the other part of it is there were at least two battles after Gettysburg where a frontal assault is decisive, that it does split the opposing war. Anybody want to take guesses? Chickamauga and Missionary Ridge. Both of those places, frontal assaults work. Now, at Chickamauga, you could say, yeah, but Mark, wait a minute, the Yankees pulled the division out of line. Well, I can't help that. They did. So the fact that the, but the, the frontal assault at Chickamauga is what breaks the, the Union Army. And at Missionary Ridge, nobody fled. They kicked us off the hill. So the fact that, the, and if you go further, go into, go into World War I and look at frontal assaults in World War I. If Lee's attack at Gettysburg was such a lesson learner, then why did we fight World War I with straight on frontal attacks for two and a half years? Because there wasn't any flanks. There wasn't anywhere to go. You know, I, I was an infantry officer, and I'm not saying that I'm not saying that to impress anybody. But I'm like you, I'm a regular person. I'll try to do something. If it doesn't work, I'll try to learn from it, and then I'll do something else. And if that doesn't work, I'll keep trying to learn. So it's not that if, if, if the frontal assault stuff, even today we still do it, although we do it in a modified fashion, but we still do it. So the frontal attack, is, although it's, everybody says, well, I should have never done that. Let me ask you, you know, when they say that, you know what my question is? So let me ask you then. So, so the least should not have broken Jackson off with 24,000 men, marched around the Union Army at Chancellorsville, attacked them in the flank, and run them off the battlefield. Lee shouldn't have done that. I mean, there was a, as much risk, actually more risk, in what he did in that um, operation, because when Jackson marches off the field, the Yankees see him. The Yankees actually see Jackson's columns pulling off the field, 24,000 men. Okay, they see them with their own eyes. Okay, so and then it's going to take all day for that walk to go 12 plus miles to come up on the far side of the Union Army and then 
that evening do the attack. Meanwhile, Lee is standing in front of the entire Union Army with 14,000 guys. That's it. That's all he's got. So that's where you come back to audacity. You come back to the fact that you do what you got to do to win. And that's it. So I guess, folks, I really don't have a whole lot more as far as stuff to tell you. I am definitely open to the questions. I definitely understand that there's gaps in my argument. Um, and some of it you may just dismiss totally. But when you do that, take a look at the big victories in military science. And then you tell me if there were any regular rules that you wouldn't do that the winning commander did. It's about me. Because it's always going to be there. There's always going to be, well, he should have never done that, but he did it anyway. I think that my final statement, and my, this, this um, presentation is in this book. It's the first essay in this book. It's called The View from Seminary Ridge. And normally, normally when I give this presentation, I don't do what I just did with you. I normally read that presentation verbatim. Now, I may break off a little bit for an ad -lib, but I normally read it. But for you, gave me a problem I hadn't had before. And that was, these folks know Gettysburg. Whereas half of that article is just trying to get people familiar with the terms, the locations, the geography, you know. So, and in my view, if I had done that in front of you, I'd put you to sleep. You know, it wasn't worth me coming to talk to you. You wouldn't have gotten anything. If you're at least in this one, if you get anything, you could say, well, he's an idiot. You won't be about that. No. But, you know, but, uh, so, anyway, again, I really appreciate you being here. I'm open to questions. And, oh, I missed my last, I was going to tell you. My last sentence in that, my last sentence in that story says the following. If God had wanted the South to win, Pickett's charge would win. That's exactly the way I feel. Okay, you're it. You're up. Yes, sir. Uh, he was an engineer. Yes, sir. Uh, from your research, did he ever go out onto that field himself to survey? No. Because when you're up at along Seminary Ridge looking at Cemetery Hill or Ridge, it looks like it is flat or not flat. It's an incline, but you don't get the appreciation of the. Well, but they had, but but remember now they had remember now they had they had pushed forward like where that's that's one of the things when I was a kid I remember everybody wrote it Bruce Cotton and everybody were critical of Sickles for moving forward to the peach orchard and the wheat field to me that was probably saved the battle for the Yankees if he had not done that if he had not caused all of the second of July fought for those places we would have got that. We would have got little round time. But he forced the fight in front. And by doing that, though, well, to answer your question, because of that, you, 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 you do have a, an understanding of the battlefield in depth up to Emmitsburg Road. Maybe not after that, but you do up to that point. And so I think you're right about it doesn't look like that. But I don't think that made that much difference anyway. As far as his planning of it, only the conduct and what, now, you, there may be a mathematician in here, and I was trying desperately to find my book, but I couldn't find the right one. Um, but the way I understand it, the actual casualties of Pickett's charge were about 50%. That 50% of Pickett's division and Pegram and Pender got back. Given the fact that you're walking across a mile of open ground with everything the Yankees can throw at you, and half of you still make it back, you know, it's not that lethal an area when you think about it. It is lethal, but it's not so much so that every man is knocked down. Using that logic, that may be why 50% of them made it back was because of the yeah. way that ventilated. Anybody else? Yep. Yes, sir. So I really appreciated your presentation. Thank you for sharing and coming all the way from Texas. And, uh, welcome home. Thanks. <laughs> um, I just visited Lexington, Virginia, and was
was at Washington and Lee University and went to the chapel, saw the carsophagus, went down, saw the tomb of Lee's family. And your statement about understanding where he came from to understand where he's going, that really resonated with me because when you look at that and you see the, the history of the Lees and the impact it had in this country, it's really stunning. But I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about that, where he's going, peace. To, to where, where did he think he was going? I, if you're talking about Gettysburg, the idea was to break through me and demolish that army to the best that he could and then keep going. He didn't, he thought that if, he really thought that if Meade was, was more or less knocked out as a combat effective force, that before he got to Washington or Baltimore, that'd be it. Now I'll tell you, so there is so much history in the Civil War that's unread and unknown because of the modern writers. And I'm not trying to be critical of anybody. But go back and read the old guys. There's a guy named J. Thomas Scharf. He, he went to the, listen to this, he went to the Confederate Naval Academy in Richmond and was commissioned. And he wrote a book on the Confederate Navy that's a thousand pages long immediately after the war and published in the 1880s. His name is J. Thomas Scharf. And in that book, he talks about things that we never heard about, that we, you know, no matter whose history you read, it's not in it. He writes one story about the Virginia, the CSS Virginia, which Yankees call Merrimack, which is the CSS Virginia, and the Monitor. And he writes about how the, the day before the Monitor gets there, the Monitor has to come down from Brooklyn through the Atlantic, through a storm, to get to the Chesapeake. But the day before that, the Virginia had come out and literally smashed into the Yankee, the largest wooden squadron they had, and took out the Minnesota and the Constitution. And was coming back out the next day to finish off that squadron. Now that night, the night before the Monitor gets to um, the Chesapeake, J. Thomas Scharf writes that there's a cabinet meeting in the White House and that all the cabinet secretaries tell Lincoln he needs to leave Washington. We don't have anything that can stop the Virginia. And they will literally sail up the Potomac and shell the White House. And the White House sends out a message to the East Coast, East Coast cities, New York, Baltimore, Boston, that the Confederates have an ironclad that we can't stop, and, it, and there's nothing we can do about it. Send all your ships to sea. It's every man for himself. Now, if Scharf is correct in that assertion, imagine George Bush on 9-11 going on television and saying to the United States, we lost the Twin Towers. We don't know how they did it. We don't know who did it, and we don't know what they're going to do tomorrow. Load your rifles and lock your doors. Imagine if that had been said to this nation. That's essentially what Lincoln said to the, to the United States. And that's why I'm saying, answering his question in an indirect way, is if the secretaries were so quick, so quick to tell the president, and you know what, the Virginia could have never got up the Potomac. The keel was too deep. It could never get there, but they automatically panicked. You know? And so that, that's why I'm answering, I hope I answered it, sir. I hope I, hope I got there, because that's what I'm trying to do, is show you that, that, that the idea was to put the fear in them that we'll take Washington if Meade's army is destroyed. Yep. Yeah, uh, I just want to echo his comments. Thank you so much for coming all the way from Texas to oh, I love to us tonight. <laughs> uh, so, Sort of a two-part question. Um, how much was trying to secure European recognition, especially in Britain and France, part of Lee's thinking? And just for a moment, play the what-if game, which I know is very dangerous. Did, did you know, in the attack with Pickett and the other divisions, was there sufficient manpower to exploit a breakthrough? Well, the Anderson didn't have enough reserves that they could have 
sealed that hole if they had and broken through. Anderson, Anderson was ready to go. I don't think it ever, the way the, the field was laid out, the way the resources were laid out, I'm not, even if we could have got on that hill, I'm not sure, unless panic took the Union Army, I'm not sure it, it could have ever penetrated the depth of what was there. Leading couldn't know what, now the other, except he tried to deal with that by sending Stewart behind him. Behind, right. But Stewart couldn't break through the federal cavalry, so, you know, that's really a big day for Sheridan and those guys. I mean, that's really their first time to really be at least a match for Jeff Stewart and, and, and that. And if he could, now, if they could have got back there, but there's so many in, when you look at that, you know. And I'll tell you what I got to do, if, if you all are, I don't know if you all know anybody, but when I was, when I was teaching for, at Fordham, I learned that the cadets love to do simulation. So when I got out of the Army, I actually created a 94 square foot, full color, three dimension replica of Gettysburg. And I fought, had the cadets at Hofstra University five years in a row fight the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, not as it was fought. They fought it as they wanted to fight it. But the point was to use that battle and to use um, everything that they had. And what you do is you put their troops where they were on like the 28th or 29th of June. And then from there, it's do whatever you want to do. And so it changes the battle a lot. But the kids loved it. I mean, if you are if you know any history, the thing I can't understand with history teachers is they never use simulation to teach. And yet, if you use it to teach, the kids have to learn more. They have to learn who everybody is, what everybody thought, what they're going to do. You know, then they, then they actually apply it. It's a, it's a whole different way to teach history. When you talk about Providence, um, what was the effect of Lee losing Stonewall Jackson? And, and of course, the way it happened. But would, do you think the war could have been a little, you know, would it be a lot different if Jackson would have lived? Because they were a very tight team. Mm -hmm. You were asking a question that's that beautiful. <laughs> Well, there's no answer. Well, your, I'm actually, I'm actually your... working on a novel. I've got 170 pages written in a, in a novel called The Adventure Stolen Days. And it's a time travel where a Texan spends 50 years of his life putting together the money and the organization to build a time machine to go back to Chancellorsville and save Stonewall Jackson's life so that he can get to Gettysburg. And in researching that, and you think about that, and the best thing about the book, if it ever publishes, you're going to want a second book because you won't know at the end of the first book. <laughs> but, I, but I think Providence is the more important issue. I think in Lee's case, on the one hand, Lee's very open in his writings about, I've lost my right arm, and what am I going to do now? But as a Christian, Providence is the will of God manifested on earth. He has a plan, and the plan's going to happen. So Jackson dying is part of Providence. It's part of everything is. And if, you, if you're a believer, I don't know how to say this exactly, but if you believe in the idea and the concept that God has a plan, and you read the Bible and he talks about he's counted every hair on your head, he knows when every sparrow will fall. He knows you before you're in your mother's womb. Okay, God has a plan. Every second, everything that happens, happens. So whether Jackson died or not has really nothing, to, if you're if you're Lee, has nothing to do with whether we went into war or not. You know, God will give me somebody else. You know, nobody, Jackson was an unknown figure. Not, he was, he was recognized. I told you, he got the most, he got three promotions in the Mexican War. Everybody in the Army knew who he was, but nobody else knew who he was. You know, so... He wasn't a significant figure until the Shenandoah. And then all of a sudden, you know, he becomes everything. But other guys do. I mean, there's other men on both sides, north and south, that really earned their spurs in the war. So, I don't know, ma'am. I, th I think Lee would have, would have said it's God's will. And when we lose, I think it's his belief in providence that, that is the guiding light for him when he turns to the Army in Northern Virginia and says, that's it. It's over. So go home. You know. 
Because look at, I mean, and I hate to do it, but I'm not trying to be a politician. I'm trying to be a historian and teach. Look at today. Look at people today who have won and lost fights. Do they quit? They say, that's it. No, they don't. They just keep killing each other. Well, Lee could have done that. There was a proposal by Wade Hampton and others, and Wade Hampton was a three-star general at the end of the war, that said, let's break the army to pieces and let them exfiltrate into the Shenandoah and into the Blue Ridge, reassemble, and fight the war. That was a, that was a, that was a discussed option. But Lee, it's over. We're done. It's over. We did our thing. I missed the end of uh, the last sentence. You said the quote, if God had meant the South to win, I missed the last sentence. Picket would have worked. Is that it, folks? Yes, sir. Didn't Lee have a supply problem? In other words, he couldn't have stayed in Pennsylvania much longer because Meade would have sent the cavalry around to destroy his supply chain. So Which he, he really had, didn't have. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't have enough manpower, materials, supplies, whatever, and he had to make a decision right there, and that, that's what That's happened. absolutely right. That, that's absolutely on the button plus. It's not just a supply. If, you, if there are any people in here who do anything competitive, very few of us, if there's any in here, go on the defense. You know, you, you're not going to control anything. The opponent's going to have all the initiative. They're the one that's going to control the fight. You, you have nothing to do except sit there and wait. You know, and number one, that ain't Lee. But number two, it's just not a winning strategy. You, you can't just sit there and wait. Now, in the Fredericksburg case, it's different because they were sitting there. They, were, they weren't going anywhere. They were coming right at us. I mean, they were just, you know, they didn't try to flank. They didn't move up and down the river. They just came straight at us. So there was no reason to to attack them, let them come. Anybody else? Like me, worn out? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, what about uh, the role of overconfidence by Lee? He felt his men could do anything he asked them to do. And he, yes, he tried both flanks, and he thought the middle was good, but. Sir, you got it on what it's called Lee's Invincibles, and that was partially right out of <laughs> uh, Chancellor's. And you know, that, that's, that's exactly what I was trying, my point I was trying to get across with Longstreet. Because he wasn't at Chancellorsville. And even though he heard about it, even though he read about it or he talked to some of the guys that were there, he didn't live through that. And anybody in this room who's ever been nice cornered, and there isn't, you're in desperate shape. And you're, all you're doing is the very last thing you can do to pull it out. If you've ever been through that and pulled it out, you know what that feeling is. There's no way to express it. It's just an unbelievable euphoria, and it's God. You just sit there and thank God. Our son, James, was shot three times in Iraq. And when, you know how we got notified? He was in Iraq and he got it somehow. They evacuated him off the field and took him to um, an aid station. And when his whole squad had been caught in the ambush, everybody, squad leader died on the ground, all the rest of them seriously wounded. And when they went, and James had a round come in through the, underneath here and go out the front. An exit wound is like three times the size of an entry wound. So, but they thought the bullet came this way. So they thought that big hole was like, he, he can't make it, it's impossible. You know? And then when they did triage, they set him aside which means you're last to get taken care of. And James asked the nurse that was there, you got a cell phone? She said yes. He takes the cell phone, calls his wife, who is also a nurse, and she's at the hospital working. So he leaves a message on the tape. I'm hit, and they're going to tell you it's bad, but I'll make it. And the phone goes. And, well, you know, when you go through that, and the very first thing we did was on our knees. Very first thing. Yeah. And then you see it play out and you see God work his stuff. And when you see a miracle like that, you, it, it's there. You can't ever forget it. And it's the same thing with Chancellorsville. They don't just beat 
hooker. They run them off the field. Okay. It's, it's, it's a complete victory. When you're outnumbered, two and a half to one. It's a complete victory. So that's the only thing I can say. I agree 100% that I, with that gentleman back there that said he thought they were invincible. Well, that's what made him think they were. Okay. All right. Mark, I'd like you to come up here a minute. Oh, well, I think you want to read something. Well, I'm just uh, right. while you're doing what you're doing, I'm trying to find that. Okay. <laughs> I felt really bad because I had the wrong channel. Okay. Well, first of all, we can we have a certificate for the, about you being here. We like to, I don't know if you wear caps, but here's a cap that says Hershey Civil War Rock. You can take that back to Texas and advertise it. <laughs> and then uh, your, your daughter's here. Uh, okay. Maybe she'll want the candy bar. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you're No, I want it. Oh, you want it. Okay. All right. And then this is from, this is from the board. Uh, a little compensation for you, but this is from the people here. This is to show their gratitude for your commitment to drive from Texas up to Hershey to do a program for us, and also to see your grandkids. Mm -hmm. so here's a little something. <laughs> I know you're going to Alabama for a wedding. That's right. You're driving there. When are you leaving? Uh, well, that we haven't figured out yet. <laughs> <laughs> Within a couple of days, going to Alabama. So there you go. General Twiggs was the general. Twiggs, yeah. Twiggs. Yeah. Thank you very much. So